Today on the Perception in Action podcast, can we use Newell's Constraints Framework to unify the typically siloed subdisciplines of sports, like skill acquisition, SNC, and biomechanics? A look at Paul Glazier's grand unifying theory of sports performance. So it's time for a call to action. Hello, and thanks for joining me. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. If you're a coach or an instructor, my goal is to help you bridge the gap between research and application, and to connect your experiential knowledge with skill acquisition and motor learning theory. I want to help take you from using practice design recipes to becoming a master chef who can manipulate the key ingredients to come up with your own innovative training methods. If you're a student or fellow academic working in the skill acquisition field, I hope to keep you up to date on the latest studies and help you get to know the people working in this area. Finally, if you're developing training technologies, I hope to help you incorporate good motor learning principles in your design, pull out key performance metrics from the data, and design effective studies to evaluate your product. To learn more, help support the podcast, and or work directly with me, please check out perceptionaction.com. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I want to look at Paul Glazier's paper from 2017 titled Towards a Grand Unifying Theory of Sports Performance. This was published in Human Movement Science as a target article along with several commentaries from some fairly well-known people in the area. So again, it's the paper format I really like. Paul's overall goal with the paper was to propose a way of integrating the frequently siloed unidisciplinary fields in sports science, like motor learning, sports psychology, strength and conditioning, biomechanics, etc., under one framework that would promote more interdisciplinary research. As he points out, we all know physiological, psychological, and biomechanical factors are all important in sports, but rarely do we consider them all together. To achieve his aim, Paul proposes a grand unifying theory, or GUT, primarily built off Newell's Constraints Framework. For those that don't know, a GUT is not only fun to say, it is actually a term used in science to describe an overarching framework to guide knowledge and theoretical development. So, as will become important when we look at some of the commentaries, a GUT is not meant to be a highly specific theory that is testable and falsifiable in and of itself, but rather it is a framework that can be used to guide the generation of testable and falsifiable hypotheses. In that way, it is not so much meant to explain or describe the way things are now, but provide a guide for how things could be integrated in the future. So with that said, let's dive into some of the details. The proposed grand unifying theory is basically comprised of three things that I've discussed on the podcast many times now. Self-organization, coordinative structures, and Newell's Constraints Framework. Quote, Different types of constraints shape emergent patterns of coordination and control at both the intra- and inter-individual levels of analysis by providing equations of constraint that metaphorically get written over multiple independent component parts or degrees of freedom to functionally combine them into task-specific structural units known as coordinative structures. Once formed, these special purpose devices are able to operate relatively autonomously by exploiting ubiquitous processes of self-organization that are inherent to many natural physical and biological systems. End quote. If nothing else, the paper gives an excellent review of these topics, so I think it's worth reading just for that reason alone. In that vein, let's look at some of the key ideas Paul reviews in the paper. First, constraints. In the paper, they are defined as, quote, Internal or external boundaries, limitations, or design features that restrict the number of possible configurations that the many degrees of freedom of a complex system can adopt. Constraints can have spatial or temporal components or both. They reside at all levels of analysis from microscopic to macroscopic, e.g. biochemical, neurological, behavioral, morphological, etc., and they operate over a multitude of different timescales, from milliseconds to years." I also really like the quote used in the paper from Newell to explain the relationship between dynamics and constraints. Quote, The order in biological and physiological processes is primarily owing to dynamics. Constraints that arise both anatomical and functional 
serve only to channel and guide dynamics. It is not that the actions are caused by constraints, it is rather that some actions are excluded by them, end quote. So in other words, constraints don't cause coordination, they serve to shape and guide it. Paul also does a very good job of emphasizing the interactive and nonlinear nature of constraints. Quote, although it is the organismic, environmental, and task constraints acting in concert that ultimately determines the pattern of coordination and control produced, the relative contribution of these three categories of constraint on sports performance is dependent on the specific requirements of the performance context and the task being performed. And quote, coordination and control is dependent not only on the performer's perception of the constraint and the action it affords, but also the state of the organism environment system at the specific moment in time. In principle, small scale changes in one of the three categories of constraints can have a large scale impact on the ensuing pattern of coordination and control. End quote. In the theory being proposed, these constraints serve to write equations of constraint that get metaphorically written over the degrees of freedom of our movement system to softly assemble task specific units known as coordinative structures. I've talked about these a few times on the podcast, but for a specific detailed example, you might want to check out my video on my YouTube channel called From Freezing to Freeing Degrees of Freedom. Link in the show notes. In that, I describe how the constraints involved in making a jump serve in volleyball can create a coordinated structure. In the paper, Paul emphasizes some of the key points. First, coordinative structures provide a solution to Bernstein's degrees of freedom problem. Quote, the large number of independent but often functionally redundant component parts of the movement system can be regulated without ascribing excessive responsibility to a higher order executive or external regulating agent, end quote. Second, coordinative structures are defined by two key operational characteristics, dimensional compression and reciprocal compensation. Dimensional compression refers to the process of taking a high dimensional system with many independent degrees of freedom, like your body with all the different joints, body parts, etc., and converting it into a low dimensional system, which consists of fewer parts that work together in stable attractor states. Reciprocal compensation refers to the ability of the parts that make up the coordinated structure to co-vary and compensate for each other, so that the output goal can still be achieved in the face of some perturbation. Finally, coordinated structures are not just for intrapersonal control, that is coordination of individual action. They can also be used to explain the coordination of multi-agent systems and interpersonal control for example, in team play in sports. Quote, So just as a coach or manager of a football team does not specify the exact motion of each of his or her players during a particular passage of play, each player's central nervous system does not prescribe the exact sequence and duration of muscle activation required to produce a particular series of limb and torso movements for a given action, for example, running or kicking. In both instances, the organization and interaction of degrees of freedom are governed only by locally created information against the backdrop of interacting organismic, environmental, and task constraints, end quote. Paul next goes on to consider how this theoretical perspective, the combination of constraints, self-organization, and coordinative structures, can be used to integrate and unify the different areas within sports science. Quote, sports biomechanics, sports performance analysis, and sports technology can provide the methods and tools for measuring and analyzing patterns of coordination and control at the intra- and inter-individual levels of analysis. Skill acquisition and motor control can enhance understanding of how coordinative structures at both the intra- and inter-individual levels of analysis are formed, and how their morphology changes during skill acquisition, how practice design and training environments can be manipulated to accelerate their assembly, and how their constituent degrees of freedom reorganize as internal and external constraints change. Motor development can provide insights into how complexity, i.e. flexibility and adaptability of physiological and biomechanical processes change across the lifespan of an athlete, and how they might impact on sports performance. Sports physiology and sports psychology, in addition to providing insights into fundamental biophysical, biochemical, and cognitive mechanisms, can provide the methods and tools for measuring and analyzing key functional organismic constraints, which have both been shown to have a substantial impact on the organization and interaction of degrees of freedom. And finally, strength and conditioning can contribute to the development of structural organismic constraints through carefully devised and implementing training interventions. End quote. 
He further notes that this is not meant to be a restrictive definitive guide of the roles of the different subdisciplines, but rather a suggestion of how they could fit together. Next, Paul expands on these ideas using two specific well-studied organismic constraints in sports performance, fatigue and anxiety. He points out that although it hasn't been studied extensively, there is some research showing that during long periods of activity, different degrees of freedom are able to adjust their contribution to the movement to minimize the overall effects of fatigue on coordination. Such findings suggest that coordinative structures and reciprocal compensation may play an important role in the response to fatigue, something that we consider mostly just to be a physiological factor. There is also some evidence that fatigue can lead to coordination solutions like freezing degrees of freedom, and not just at the individual level. For example, Paul cites a study by Button and colleagues which reported that the organization and interactions between players on a soccer team became more regular and predictable as fatigue collectively accumulated, similar to what we see in freezing for individual coordination. Finally, he cites research showing that more skilled performers seem to be able to offset the effects of fatigue by changing their coordination pattern used for a table tennis stroke. So overall, the idea here is that bringing in the concepts of constraints and coordinated structures gives a much richer interdisciplinary view of what is going on with fatigue. Turning to the constraint of anxiety, Paul points out that this again can be understood in terms of self-organization of coordinated structures. Quote, Similar to the research on the effects of fatigue on sports performance, a common finding to emerge from these few extant studies focusing on this issue is that anxiety tends to increase the rigidity or stiffness of joints, indicating a temporary regression to an earlier stage of skill learning. End quote. This is something I've found in some of my baseball and golf studies, for example. Finally, he also links this to the well-studied role of focus of attention in sports performance. Quote, Although most prevailing explanations of the effect of focus of attention on motor behavior and performance have been based on information processing theory, for example, the constrained action hypothesis, it may be posited that attention represents another psychological constraint that acts to rigidly couple degrees of freedom and disrupt inherent self-organizing processes, end quote. Finally, Paul discusses some critical issues related to measurement and analysis of sports performance data emphasizing the need for more use of integrated technology that allows for in-situ instead of out-of-context lab measurements, the need for more process and extended time series measurements instead of using just discrete performance outcome variables, and finally, more work emphasizing the coordination of multiple degrees of freedom, i.e. whole body movements and team-level analysis, instead of reductionistic paradigms which focus on a single element in the system. To sum up the paper using Paul's words, quote, The grand unifying theory of sports performance proposed in this target article, which is based on the conceptual model introduced originally by Newell 1986, asserts that at both the intra- and inter-individual levels of analysis, patterns of coordination and control, which directly determine the performance outcome, emerge from the confluence of interacting organismic, environmental, and task constraints, via the formation and self-organization of coordinative structures. Although there are measurement and analysis issues that need to be resolved, the gut advanced here could provide a platform on which applied sports scientists can integrate their respective skills and knowledge, provide a more holistic understanding of sports performance, increase explanatory power of applied research work, and guide applied research programs. End quote. As I mentioned, there were several commentaries published along with this target article. So let's have a look at some of those before I give my two cents. Overall, the commentators, who included people like Keith Davids, Mark Williams, and Michael Turvey, expressed a somewhat similar view, that while this unifying theory was a noble attempt, it falls short for a few different reasons. And one even took the opportunity to use the obvious play on words and call it gutless. The main criticisms included a lack of novelty in the theory, as the paper was seen as just restating Newell's basic ideas, a lack of true theoretical integration, as the paper doesn't really incorporate any other theory to understanding behavior other than dynamical systems theory, and the lack of specific testable hypotheses generated by the theory being proposed. Finally, there is also a view expressed that sports performance is just too complex to be explained by the theory being proposed, which, as a couple of the commentators note, has really only been tested extensively on very simple actions like interlimb coordinations, for example, in the studies of Kelso and colleagues. 
Some example quotes to illustrate the views of the commentators. At present, differentiation from Newell's conceptual framework has not occurred, and what is proposed only partially adheres to a grand theory criteria. A proposed theory will need to integrate across theoretical perspectives and across the sports sciences if grand unification is to be achieved. If viewed as a traditional explanatory scientific theory, or indeed a grand unifying theory, there needs to be additional explanations, propositions, or predictions that can encompass and explain the intra- and inter-athlete diversity, complexity, and variability in sports performance. End quote. And, in its current form, no specifications are given as to how the different constraints interact with each other. Therefore, in principle, it is always possible to rationalize either another constraint or another interaction between the constraints to accommodate any particular outcome imaginable. As the constraint theory basically aims to factor in all possible parameters, it will on logical grounds never be possible to conduct a completely controlled experiment factoring in all constraints. Consequently, it is not possible to derive a testable hypothesis in a strict sense. End quote. The two most interesting commentaries for me come from the authors that know the ideas the best, and you would expect to be most sympathetic to Paul's ideas. Responses by Lopez, Philippe, and Turvey, and Ludovic, Seifert, Keith, Davids, and colleagues. Both of these groups argue that Paul's grand unifying theory, which is based primarily on dynamical systems theory concepts, is insufficient on its own. Lopez, Philippe, and Turvey note that, quote, a notable limitation of dynamical systems theory approaches, however, is that they make no direct claims about the characteristics of the systems under inquiry, nor do they provide a theoretical basis for understanding the principles governing the system's behavior, end quote. While Seifert et al. write that, quote, what is missing from these preliminary insights is a principled basis in the form of pillars for understanding the cornerstones of the sports medicine profession, and this lack of an overarching theoretical framework is also somewhat of a limitation in Glazier's initial ideas, and that a constraints-led approach is only part of the necessary comprehensive rationale. Another thing that both emphasize is that the gut proposed is overly focused on movement, neglecting information and perception. Interestingly, both sets of commentators suggest that the shortcomings of Paul's gut can be addressed by the same means, by bringing Gibson into the story. Lopez, Philippe, and Turvey propose a functional semantics for sport, which essentially links the coordination and constraints idea Paul discusses with the concepts of affordances and effectivities. Seifert, Davids, and colleagues, perhaps not surprisingly, argue that the route to unification and interdisciplinarity would better come from following an ecological dynamics approach, which combines dynamical systems theory ideas with those from ecological psychology. For those interested in ecological dynamics, I would highly recommend reading the full commentary by Seifert and colleagues, because it does a good job explaining what ecological dynamics is exactly and how it differs from other approaches like dynamical systems theory. Of course, with this type of article, Paul also gets the opportunity to respond to these critiques. In this, he emphasizes the following points. His grand unifying theory is more than just Newell's constraints theory, as it brings in coordinative structures and self-organization, so the combination and its application is novel. A gut is not meant to provide a specific testable hypothesis, but rather guts are intended to provide a broad, overarching explanation for a discipline or body of knowledge, and a foundation on which to develop mid-range and micro-theories, which display many of the hallmark features that some of the commentators incorrectly associate with a grand unifying theory, like falsifiability. In his response, Paul is somewhat dismissive of the suggestions from Turvey Davids et al. related to affordances. Quote, However, I would respectively suggest that affordances are still somewhat esoteric, and prudence is required when evaluating empirical data that purportedly confirm their existence and role in sports performance. And quote, as its name implies, ecological dynamics is essentially the conjoining of principles and concepts of a dynamical systems theory and ecological psychology, and one of its perceived virtues seems to be that it offers a more explicit role for perceptual information. But is this sufficient rationale to warrant a new theory? Or is it simply a new take on an existing theory? A core concept of ecological dynamics is affordances. But since Gibson suggested that, quote, affordances do not cause behavior but constrain or control it, end quote, could affordances not just be interpreted as another type of informational constraint? Could ecological dynamics and the constraints-based approach therefore not just be viewed as one and the same thing? End quote. Okay, what are my thoughts on this paper? 
First of all, I would ask, what exactly are we trying to unify here? As I've discussed a lot recently in my videos reviewing attempts to do this, I don't think it's possible to unify across the two main theoretical lines of sports performance, the ecological and information processing theory approaches. And this is definitely not what Paul is trying to achieve here. So instead, I think this paper could achieve potentially two things. One, integrating the quote-unquote believers, that is connecting different sub-disciplines within sports science that are using common ecological approaches. And second, perhaps convincing some of the quote-unquote non-believers of the benefits of the ecological approach, specifically by demonstrating that it can be used to explain behavior at multiple levels, from physiology to psychology. So similar to some of the commentators, although I recognize that it's an accepted term, I think using grand unifying theory here might have been counterproductive in this case. Explaining everything within one existing theoretical umbrella is not the unification most people are looking for and is going to be very unsatisfying to most people. This was expressed directly in one of the commentaries. Quote, What is presented here is not a unified discussion, but is actually limited to dynamical systems theory and does not necessarily consider or integrate other theoretical perspectives even within motor control and learning, such as optimal feedback control theory, information processing theory, or computational neuroscience, end quote. One of the things I really appreciate about Paul's paper is that he attempts to integrate the ideas and show how they relate to each other. For example, the relationship between constraints, coordinated structures, and self-organization of behavior. We need a lot more of this, in my opinion, if we're going to have a comprehensive theory. This is something that is a bit lacking at the moment with ecological dynamics for me. For example, where exactly do affordances fit in? Are they constraints, like Paul discusses? Are they primarily involved in selecting actions and setting intentions, like Bill Warren has proposed? Or are they directly involved in the control of action, for example in Brett Fagin's affordance-based control theory? I think all the pieces we need for an ecological approach to understanding sports performance are there, we just need to spend more time testing and thinking about how they fit together. So in sum, I think Paul's efforts to pull together the pieces of the theories that I tend to lump under the term ecological approach is really important to continue to advance this area. And I agree with him that it will naturally lead to more interdisciplinary approaches if followed. So definitely unification, but maybe not as grand as some would like. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast, work one-on-one with me, or receive bonus materials including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now, and keep them coupled. I hear the winter.